I'll do the opening first, sir. Hold on one second. All right, live stream is rolling. Sergeants, please start your recordings. Couldn't hear you, uh, Sergeant Polite. Total recording is good. Is that Got you now. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee of Fire and Emergency Management. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification? Once again, all panelists, please turn on your videos for verification. Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for cooperation. Chair Borelli, we're ready to begin. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Uh, at this virtual hearing for the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. Today, the committee will be conducting oversight on the fire department's work in promoting the safe operations of commercial establishments in light of COVID-19 related regulations. And we'll be hearing number uh, introduction number 1891, sponsored by myself, uh, which involves Zambonis. I'd like to acknowledge that we have been joined by our colleagues and I see council member Maisel and that is all I believe I see at the moment. Good morning, I'm Council Member Joe Borelli and I'm Chair of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. Today we are here to discuss the Fire Department's Bureau of Fire Prevention's role in promoting safe commercial operations in compliance with regulations put in place to limit the spread of COVID-19. The Fire Department's Bureau of Fire Prevention is responsible for inspecting buildings and businesses for compliance with various fire and building code requirements. Specifically, FDNY regularly inspects the places of assembly, such as restaurants, to ensure safe operations. This includes inspecting whether means of egress are unobstructed and occupancy limits are followed. As businesses and restaurants operate with many COVID-related restrictions in place, some tightening in response to growing infection rates in the city and beyond, establishments have adapted to new realities by altering seat layouts and increasingly using outdoor spaces to maximize social distancing and comply with occupancy limits. This effort has been aided by the city's open streets program and this council's recent legislation authorizing the use of portable propane heaters for outdoor dining. Today, the committee hopes to examine the department's role in inspecting places of assembly for compliance with amended occupancy limits and other COVID related uh, regulations. Additionally, the committee will learn more about coordinated efforts between FDNY, DOT, DOB, and other agencies in providing places of assembly with necessary guidance and support in ensuring the safe and efficient reopening of New York City. Finally, the committee will hear legislation that I have introduced to alleviate a burdensome restriction on one type of small businesses. Introduction 1891 would amend fire code regulations affecting the use of machines to resurface ice, frequently referred to as Zambonis after its inventor, Frank Zamboni, who I'm told, according to the committee council, just converted an army Jeep into some sort of device for smoothing ice. Currently, pursuant to fire code, certain gas-fueled industrial machines, including Zambonis, are prohibited from using more than one 40-gallon canister of liquefied petroleum gas or other flammable gas. The most commonly used is propane. Under the proposed legislation, a Zamboni will be permitted to utilize two propane canisters at any given time, uh, which would align local regulations with most commercial manufacturer designs. This com committee looks forward to hearing from both the administration and the public on this important oversight topic uh, and the introduction being heard today. Uh, and with that, uh, I will turn it over to our moderator, uh, Josh Kingsley, to go over the procedural items. I still do not see any other council members, uh, so uh, we'll proceed. Thank you, Chair Borelli. Good morning, everyone. I'm Josh Kingsley, Counsel to the Fire and Emergency Management Committee of the New York City Council. Uh, before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. 
uh, when you will be unmuted by the host. Um, I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, and I will periodically be announcing who's the next panelist to testify. The first panelists will be giving testimony from the fire department, uh, and it will be representatives uh, Kevin Brennan, who's the Deputy Assistant Chief of the Bureau of Fire Prevention, and Kelly Carr, who's the Deputy Co-Development Counsel, also for the Bureau of Fire Prevention. I will be calling on you when it's your turn to speak. Uh, during the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. Uh, as, as said earlier, all hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, and I will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. I will call on each of you by name. Um, please raise your right hand. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? And so we'll start with Chief Brennan. And, and bear with us as we kind of, I think we're going to do the meeting on our end. So yes, go ahead. Chief Brennan? Yes, yes I understand. Ms. Carr? So so now you all are free to, we'll, we'll meet you on our end and you could go ahead and uh, deliver testimony. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Chair Borelli and all the council members present today. My name is Kevin Brennan. I'm the Deputy Assistant Chief of the Bureau of Fire Prevention at the Fire Department. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the Bureau of Fire Prevention's efforts in promoting safe COVID-19 reopening across New York City. The Bureau of Fire Prevention primarily enhances the safety of the public by providing certifications and permits and by conducting inspections designed to reduce the loss of life and property from fires and explosions. For instance, in connection with the COVID pandemic, the Bureau mobilized a group of inspectors who facilitated the establishment of temporary hospital and field hospital units. By putting a priority on these inspections, we were able to support efforts to open these facilities in remarkably short time periods. We also provided inspections to facilities as part of the Department of Education's Learning Bridges program, which provides free childcare options for children of essential workers. However, the fire department is also frequently called upon to assist with safety efforts that are outside the department's core mission. Our members take pride in serving the people of New York in these scenarios as well. During the coronavirus pandemic, BFP members have regularly been deployed to support efforts by the administration and fellow agencies in combating the virus and ensuring that individuals and businesses are acting with appropriate precautions. Throughout the course of the pandemic, BFP inspectors have served as part of COVID related efforts involving a variety of issues. In the spring, our members helped to enforce social distancing requirements visiting locations under the direction of the mayor's office to educate individuals and businesses owners about the importance of staying six feet apart, distributing masks and enforcing other spacing protocols. As restrictions evolved and the city began to reopen, the department began participating in phased reopening fire safety inspections in tandem with the inspections related to COVID universal reopening requirements. These reopening inspections matched ones being conducted by our fellow city agencies and incorporated New York State Universal Reopening Guidelines. This involved working through a reopening checklist, ensuring that locations were operating with appropriate universal reopening guidelines, providing education, and when necessary, enforcement of those guidelines. Simultaneously, our other BFP inspectors joined counterparts from fellow agencies to provide assistance with outdoor dining configurations, helping the Department of Transportation ensure that dining setups met DOT uh, regulations. More recently, the mayor's office requested 90 BFP personnel to assist with its COVID hot zone efforts. Under this working group, inspectors from the fire department and other agencies were deployed to neighborhoods in the city that were experiencing spikes in positive COVID tests to help emphasize the importance of following safety protocols and getting tested. Since rates in those hot zones have decreased, 
about a third of our inspectors have been able to return to their normal Bureau of Fire Prevention duties. The fire department has also been tasked under legislation passed by the council after our hearing a few weeks ago to provide support for comfort heating and outdoor dining areas. The legislation temporarily authorized the use of propane, a portable propane fueled heaters for comfort heating, which otherwise remain unlawful under the current New York City Fire Code. The Bureau has dedicated a team of inspectors to visit restaurants to verify that propane heaters are being used appropriately. Taken together, these efforts require a great deal of resources. However, the fire department recognizes that it's important for the city to reopen in a safe manner that allows businesses to get back on track. Introduction 1891. Introduction 1891 would amend the New York City Fire Code to exempt ice resurfacing machines known as Zambonis from existing requirements that prohibit certain powered industrial machines from utilizing more than one container of propane and instead allow a Zamboni to utilize two containers of propane. As you know from our testimony a few weeks ago on the topic of heaters, propane is a flammable substance. The fire code strictly regulates the storage, handling, and use of propane because of the significant hazard it poses. Propane is flammable and can readily be ignited by a spark. If confined or exposed to fire, it poses an explosion hazard. Before amending the code to include a Zamboni exemption from a general rule, we'd be curious to know more about the necessity for such an exemption and what factors might distinguish this type of industrial propane use from other types of industrial propane use. I'll now answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, can you, can you tell us uh, just given during the scope of the pandemic, what was the most frequent type of violation that was issued by the Bureau of Fire Prevention? Uh, it's a very broad question, can, a little more specific. I mean, um, we did a bunch of different enforcement efforts since the spring, um, you know, between social distancing, outreach, education and enforcement, and then the uh, mayoral nine point checklist survey, um, so we've had different initiatives. Um, most of our efforts were always to educate and inform versus uh, you know, writing violations. Uh, and that's generally been our, our uh, position in general, even prior to the pandemic. Um, and now more than ever with you know, the current uh, you know, economic climate and everything with the pandemic, we're you know, doing our best, you know, going above and beyond to work with businesses uh, you know, to get them to comply by educating and informing. And how much discretion do, does an inspector have? Because I appreciate that you said the goal is to, to inform and educate rather than violate. Um, who actually has the, the discretion in whether a violation versus a, you know, a, a good talking to is what's warranted? Uh, that really comes down to the inspector, the fire inspector on the scene. Um, and like I said, we generally are there to educate and inform. Uh, if we you know, return and find repeat offenders, you know, that's when maybe some uh, enforcement action does take place at that point, or maybe a third time. But, you know, we understand the situation of the, you know, the businesses in the city right now, economically, you know, particularly restaurants, et cetera. And we're, you know, more than willing to, like I said, to educate and inform, because a lot of them are not informed, you know. Um, so, we, you know, we're doing our best to do that and, you know, accommodate them as best we can to get them to comply. You know, safety, of course, is paramount. We want them to operate safely. And, and to that end, we, you know, we do the, you know, the best we can. Are, are you giving restaurant uh, inspectors guidelines for restaurants? You know, in other words, if, if someone is open at 25%, but they have, you know, 30% uh, current occupancy, uh, is, is that treated one day versus if that same restaurant were to have, say, you know, 50 or 60%? Well, we want them to comply with the guidelines from the city and state with the 25%. Um, you know, certainly it's the discretion of the inspector on the scene, you know, as far as if they're complying with the 25%, if they're, you know, a few people over, it's, you know, it's, um, it, it's all up to the inspector, you know, on the scene. So, since the uh, uh, implementation of some of the new heating rules, 
Uh, and I'm sure many of the restaurants complied with that or attempted to comply with that very quickly given the onset of cold weather. Uh, what is the result of some of the inspections regarding heating? Have they been complying with what's been recommended or is there a lot of, um, for lack of a better word, jerry-rigging of, of uh, heating devices, et cetera? Well, in general, uh, we found that from our inspection so far that a lot of restaurant owners are not aware of the guidance. Um, you know, they heard the mayor announce that he was allowing the use of propane and they went out and bought heaters, you know, and they're using them. Um, from the inspections that we've done so far with the whole process of having the, you know, to file an attestation and stuff and gone out, um, a lot of restaurants have difficulty complying with the guidelines because we have, you know, fire department guidelines and you have department of transportation guidelines with respect to the sidewalk and stuff. Um, so we go out and educate and inform them what they are and, um, yeah, they're doing their best to comply. So seeing some of the structures that have been built um, at street level in New York, is there any concern about the, the fire safety of those temporary, but, but you know, suddenly they're, they're becoming a bit more permanent, but the temporary structures we see being built, whether they be out of wood or tent uh, or, or anything, do you, as, as an agency, have a, a concern over the fire safety of those type of structures? Yeah. Uh, that's more of a DOB issue. Uh, we're certainly concerned from a fire aspect as far as access you know, to the front of the building. And if any fire hydrants are obstructed at um, you know, the curb line, which according to you know, the DOT guidance, the, 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 you know, I believe you have to have 15 feet on each side of the fire hydrant, um, uh, unobstructed. I think it's 10 or 15 feet. Um, but but we, if someone sees a propane heater and it's abutting, uh, you know, a, a, a fabric tent or something, the inspector... Well, that has... Would... Yeah, they have to be five feet from anything combustible or wood, wood, you know, wood structure or tables or chairs, plastic. There's a five-foot... Um, guideline that the heaters have to be five feet. So that, that, that's my question. I guess maybe even anecdotally, uh, are the inspectors coming back into the office saying that uh, we have some concerns over the, the the flammable nature of some of these structures, and and uh, you know, are, are they worried about a fire within those? Well, there's always concern if the heater's too close to a, a, a combustible fabric of sort. That's why we don't allow the heaters under any kind of tent structures. Uh, they should be, you know, five feet away and not under, you know, any kind of tent structure for that reason that you just stated. At some point, do you see a, 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 a trading off where it's, it's uh, probably less dangerous to be inside of a restaurant rather than outside with, uh, with some of these heaters operating? I'm sorry, you're asking, could you repeat that question? Yeah, I mean, at some point, is there a, a point where the department might feel it's it's safer to be in a, in a restaurant at say fifty percent capacity rather than a temporary structure that's being blown out with heaters? Yeah, that's not something the fire department would really uh, would really answer. Uh, it's not something I could speak to. Um. um so I just want to go to intro 1891 real quick. I also want to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Deutsch. I know he's here. So just please let the record reflect that. Um, what is the basis for limiting industrial machines from utilizing only one 40 pound canister of propane? Like, I mean, I understand a lot of different machines use these. Why is it, you know, why is it only one? Why can't a contractor store, you know, two on site or, or whatever the number may be? It's, it's been a long-standing provision in the fire code. The propane is a very dangerous gas. Uh, it's flammable, like we stated. Uh, and I think the one cylinder on the machine is pretty much the standard for other types of that machinery, like high-lows and stuff. Um, and it's also an NFPA guideline. Um, so as I stated in my testimony earlier, we'd be curious to hear why, you know, what the council's thinking is, so, you know, what's, you know, why would, this be a carve out like an exemption just for Zambonis versus other types of that gas powered equipment. Uh, 
Um, yeah, well, as, as, as we've sort of heard from the industry, they, they used to, the manufacturer spec uh, typically used to, and with one, they run out very quickly because I, I assume they use it for both propulsion and for heating, uh, heating and ice. Um, does, the, does the department have any difference of propane regulations or flammable gas regulations between indoor and outdoor facilities? No, I mean, the regulations for those gas powered um, equipment like that is pretty much the same across the board, you know, so we'd be like, so we'd be curious, you know, why the exemption for this industry versus other industries that use the similar gas powered equipment like that. Um, you know, I think we've had um, such a low um, number of uh, very few, if any, incidents with propane in the city. And that's because of our, you know, the fire code, our strict guidelines with the regarding the use of the propane, because it is a very dangerous gas. Is, is are there are there any instances that you can point to of, of propane incidents in, in other jurisdictions? Is, is, it, is it, in other words, is this something that happens frequently? Yeah, they had just recently they had a Zamboni go on fire up in Rochester, New York, uh, a few months ago, and. Uh, Back a while back, uh, there was a fire in Philadelphia at the uh, Ice Works rink in Aston, where Zamboni caught fire. Okay. Uh, does the department have any current variances to any ice rink operators to, to permit uh, an additional canister of propane? Not that I'm aware of offhand, no. Okay, so I, I don't have any more questions. Uh, Josh, if you could signal to me whether any other council members have questions. No. Okay. Uh, that is it, guys. Councilmember Council Deutsch maybe has raised his hand. Okay. Or am I mistaken? Councilmember Deutsch. Hi. How you doing? So um, I have a question. I have a few questions. Uh, several several zip codes within my district were in the red zone for almost two months. Can you give a breakdown of what kind of summonses uh, the FDNY uh, issued during those few months? Uh, that's my first question. And the second question is that you did say that the inspector has discretion of when to issue the summons. Does a business owner have a right to ask for a supervisor questioning that inspector's discretion? Uh, to your first question, uh, with the hotspot inspections, um, we was this was a mayoral you know, initiative. Those who I spoke about in my testimony, the ninety inspectors we originally had, uh, they were given you know daily assignments in different geographic areas of the city. Our primary role with that enforcement was to educate and instruct. Um, we handed out about sixty three hundred face masks. Um, we also conducted the nine, the nine point mural survey in 522 locations. Um, there were no violations issued during those inspection efforts, those COVID hotspot enforcement efforts. It was all about education and instruction. So the FDNY did not issue any violations in, in those hotspots? Not with regard to the you know, mission of going out and informing and instructing with as far as weight, you know, it's COVID uh, related uh, guidelines with face masks, social distancing, etc. So yeah. was there another mission to issue summonses opposed to the education mission? No, not with that, not with that initiative, no. So there was there was no there were no summonses issued by the FDNY. Um, on small business owners during the month and a half that um, my district was in the red zone? Well, if you, are you referring to fire safety issues? That's a different issue. I mean, the, the... Uh, I'm, I'm, re I'm referring to um, social distancing or not having the lock sheet um, ready available or any any violations or any violation violations issued by the FDNY um, in the hot spots. To my knowledge, the, the, the initiative with the hotspot uh, enforcement that our, our inspectors were uh, assigned to do, 
no, there was no violations issued with regard to social distancing guidelines or violating social. It was all about instructing and educating. And so we handed out, you know, thousands of face masks. If, you, if there was any uh, fire safety violations that inspectors maybe encountered while they were in a business or something like that, uh, that I can't speak to, you know, in this hearing right here, maybe, you know, some, some of that may have occurred, but I'm, I don't have those stats in front of me today. So the FDNY was only uh, asked to enforce fire safety violations. And other than that, only to conduct education. Is that correct? No, the, the mission of the hotspot inspections or enforcement was social, all geared towards COVID, social distancing, mask wearing, et cetera. That was the, the mission of our inspectors in the different zip codes uh, that we went to. And it, it did change day to day or week to week. And like I said, we handed out over 6,000 face masks. It was a lot of in education and instruction. And there were no violations issued for violating COVID guidelines. Got it. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're also joined by council members Brannon and Cabrera, and I'll give either of them uh, a minute to uh, use the raise hand function if they have any questions. If not, we will move on. Council, is there any more people signed up to testify? Yes, we do have public testimony after this. So if, if no other council members have questions at this time, we're able to uh, move on to the public component of the hearing. Yep, yep thank you. Thanks, folks. So thank you, everyone. Um, we're gonna now uh, move on to public testimony. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike your typical council hearing, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function on Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and you can begin talking. There's gonna be no timer at this time, so just feel free to concisely uh, make a statement, and we'll have any questions after that. Um, so to start, we will have um, Michael Reardon um, from uh, Local 2507. So we'll unmute you on our end if you just bear with us. Mr. Reardon, I believe you might have to authorize us to unmute you on your end if there's an icon popping up. How's that? That's perfect. Thank you so much. You're good to go. Good morning, everyone. I just uh, like to thank the Chair Borelli, members of the Council, allowing me to speak today on behalf of the men and women inspectors in the Bureau of Fire Prevention. Today I'll be speaking on COVID-19 Task Force assignments. As fire inspectors, we are the only members of the FDNY assigned to community COVID-19 hotspots. We have not been issued the highest standard of PPE, especially because we're working in hot zones with the newly issued masks that firefighters and EMTs are being issued to protect against the virus. Unlike other FDNY units who get free coronavirus testing on the second floor of Metro Tech headquarters, we are not offered the same basic health services. Our inspectors are assigned every day including weekends to these hot zone task force. 
COVID Task Force Hotspots. On September 29th, 2020, Chief of Fire Prevention, Jordan, gave the order to cancel all fire department testing of fire suppression systems to deal with the COVID-19 hotspots. The manpower of the COVID-19 effort was the entire fire suppression unit field personnel, 75% of the Rangehood unit, which prevents restaurants fires, 75% of the CDA unit that prevents construction and demolition accidents. We had two members from the hazardous cargo unit, which handles transportation of the hazardous cargo and materials. We had three members of the bulk fuel safety unit, which handles the power plants and the service stations of private fills in New York City. And our laboratory unit, we had two members from the laboratory unit also attending on this. 107 inspectors' names were submitted for reassignment to provide approximately 90 inspectors per day to participate primarily in handling our face masks at a minimum 500 masks per inspector. Secondary, they are also tasked with checking on establishments that are supposed to be closed in the red zones and to enforce compliance with lesser restrictions in the orange and yellow zones. As a result of this reassignment, over 640 fire suppression tests were canceled, which were previously temporarily delayed from March and April this year. In total, over 1,500 field inspections were canceled, including reinspections, complaints, referrals, investigations of systems failure due to fire operations. The scale and suddenness of this reassignment is an obvious danger to public safety, the danger from coronavirus notwithstanding. We understand that all hands must be on deck to fight the pandemic. However, this must be measured by balance and risk and resources. Handing out masks is absolutely not the best use of our fire prevention inspectors, knowledge and skills from the platform of a public safety. There are also adverse economic consequences in delaying and the issuance of both construction and new restaurant permits. That should be a policy priority given the city's fi financial crisis. After cons consolidation, the mayor's office agreed to reduce the number of inspections, inspectors to 54, 20 from suppression, 20 from Rangehood, 10 from CDA, four from hazardous cargo, and three from the bulk fuel safety unit and two from the laboratory unit. To date, the FPI task force has distributed over 700,000 face coverings throughout the boroughs. Our participation in this important effort should maximize our expertise in service of the public. We suggest that community groups, students, volunteers, or part-time clerical workers be used to distribute masks so the FPIs can focus on the code and safety enforcement of the fire department. In closing, the fire department, the fire prevention inspectors are responsible for the dramatic reduction in fires and deaths in the city over the last decade because of our high standards and professionalism in our inspections. That's the end of mine. And if anybody has any questions. Yes, I, I have one question. Yeah, Joe. Mike, can, can you just clarify? So the inspectors who are on the, the hot zone task force, if they want to get a COVID test, they can't go to Metro Tech and be given a test like with, with a high priority like, like anyone else in the department? Correct. They would have to go to their own doctor or to an urgent care or something like that. Okay. I, I, I think the they committee uh, will, will send a letter to the department just to hopefully change that because I don't think the number is so large that it's going to overwhelm them. Um, so well, the thing, well, the thing is, Joe, you got to realize they're out there every day in the hot spots, and now they're coming into headquarters. But what's to okay. say that they might bring it into headquarters if someone is sick? So that's so what is the goal not to have access to the, to the testing facility? No, no, we're just trying to we're asking to be tested downstairs. And when they come in, if they want to get tested, they should be able to. Okay, um, I'm, I'm gonna have someone just follow up with you on that. And just get 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 the get, get the ask, and then our committee will put the request in with the department. Okay, great. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thanks, Chair Borelli. Um, I think we're on to our last individual um, for testimony. Uh, we have Lyric Thompson. Um, I believe you are ready to go. Unmuted and video up and running. Go ahead. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, my name is Lyric Thompson, and I'm not calling or here about a Zamboni or anything like that. I'm here about fire safety with regard to egress and uh, entrance doors for buildings. I'm in a 421A building that was unlawfully signed off and our attempts to get this building up to code have been seriously frustrated by housing preservation and development. Now, the entrance doors of buildings are supposed to be fire rated and self-closing and self-locking. This is part of the fire code to prevent uh, the spread of fire. In 2017, there was a a devastating fire in the Bronx that killed 13 people and at which time everybody cared about whether the door was self-closing or self-locking. That's not the only fire protections that doors are supposed to have. They're also supposed to be fire rated. Now in, in our entrance building, our, our building, our entrance door has had a lot of problems. We have had over 300 inspections with HPD. HPD has written and removed probably 30 plus violations. They've done emergency repairs on the door and about four and a half years of that, and then we find out that the door isn't fire rated. The door got sealed shut. It took about 45 minutes to open it. And during this time, I'm thinking, what if this building were on fire? We don't have access to the backyard because we found the landlord hacking at gas lines, so he denies us access. There would be nowhere for these tenants to go. And when I opened the door, I was horrified to find that not only was that door not fire rated, but our smoke stopping door is also not fire rated. Now, I don't mean to be rude, but I kind of think that at least one of those 300 inspectors that came through our building should have picked up the fact that our door wasn't up to basic standard code. I mean, the basic code that we put in place. Is there a reason that HPD doesn't know the standards that they're supposed to enforce with regard to fire safety and entrance doors? I mean, the code says that this is their responsibility to maintain this. Now, it took a, it took a lot of work to actually get a violation on uh, that door for fire rating. I had to call Tim Hogan of DOB, the commissioner, the commissioner of buildings. I had to get him to send his people out to get a violation. HPD came out and wrote violations and then they subsequently removed the violations. Seven days after they removed the violation on a door that was not repaired, hadn't even been touched, the fire department had to come out and remove that defective piece of door hardware from my building before it caught the building on fire. I love the fire department. We've got a great fire department. Our fire guys have saved our lives on more than one occasion. Council member Borelli, what are you going to do to address the fact that HPD has no clue what standards they're supposed to enforce with regard to fire safety? I mean, these standards aren't just put in place for the tenants. They're put in place for the firefighters to protect them too. And they risk their lives. I, I, I think they risk their lives enough just by running into a, a burning building to get us, to get our animals, our pets, our dead grandmother's you know, photos. We, you know, as a citizen, I really kind of need HPD to know these standards. So what are you going to do, Council Member Borelli, to ensure that HPD knows these standards? It's your turn. It's your turn. I asked you a question. It wasn't just, you know, throwing it out there. Is there something that you can do to ensure that HPD knows these standards? Thank you, Mrs. Thompson. Uh, this committee doesn't have jurisdiction over HPD. The buildings uh, committee will be meeting again in December. However, if you would state your address for the record, we could ask the fire department to uh, send one of their folks again, just to see if there are any fire code violations that are still outstanding. You just say okay. your address. It's 1355 Decatur Street. There's a lovely ProPublica story about our building and 421A fraud. Which borough, I'm sorry? Brooklyn. And okay. the reason I brought it, the reason I brought it to you is because you, you are over the fire codes, you know, and kind of all of these agencies have to work together in tandem to ensure public safety. So yes, no, I understand. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Josh, if you would just record the address and then uh, make sure we follow up with uh, the department. Thank you. So council member, that's, that's everyone who's uh, signed up to testify. So if you're uh, at your convenience, you could close out the hearing. Okay.
Uh, thank you very much on today's hearing. Uh, with that, seeing no other people here to testify uh, and no other council members have questions, uh, I will gavel out the hearing now.